Good morning, everybody. You here? Let me close my door. All right, so there's some humans that are paying attention. Man, I didn't know. I didn't know until I got there. I think the weather's getting worse now than it was then. Um, I am recording this and hopefully we'll figure out how to get that recording to you so that um, you can look at it and do what needs to be done as we move forward. So in the meantime, let's just go ahead and, and get rolling. I'm gonna share my screen and then we'll get started. Um, Everybody hearing me okay? Everybody sort of, I don't know. Yes, thank you, Sydney. All right, so uh, share screen, whiteboard, share. Okay, so um, if all we had with chemistry was just the atoms, the way we just had it, um, and we just looked even at just the different isotopes, um, different varieties of each atom, there wouldn't be enough. Uh, we'd be done with chemistry almost. Um, but there's you know, a reason why a million different new compounds are, are created every single semester, not every semester, every year, a million. This is a live um, science and it's because chemistry and chemical compounds are everything. This is why we're here to learn about chemistry. And when we talk about compounds, everybody knows what these are. Okay, so a chemical compound has a constant composition and it's from combining atoms in small counting number ratios to form new substances. And that's the key, new substances, small counting number ratios. It's never gonna be like carbon, 300,000 hydrogens, right? It's always gonna be like carbon, four hydrogens two carbons, four oxygens, that kind of thing, for the most part. I mean, we can get great big molecules, DNA, um, things like this, but for the most part in this class anyway, we're going to be dealing with much smaller compounds. And this is versus a mixture, which is variable ratios. Can be separated, right? So if we had a little bit of sand and a whole bunch of salt, we could also add a little bit more sand so that the ratio isn't really the same. And we could also separate out the sand from the salt. So that's the difference between a compound and a mixture. And we already talked a little bit about heterogeneous and homogeneous mixtures at the beginning of class. So at the very beginning of science, we talked about how um, scientists would gather the elements and try to pile them into their physical properties. But it turns out that this is not a, um, a useful way to look at them 
for chemical reactions. And it's because it's more about the chemical reactions, not the physical, the chemical composition, not the physical. And so the periodic table reflects the chemical properties, okay? So um, we're gonna take a quick look at one little bit of the periodic table to give you an idea of why. So if we look at 7A on the periodic table, and this is sort of what it looks like, and if we zoom all the way in, this is 7A, I don't know how well you can see that. There's F, C, L, B, R, and I, and then something else, A, T, I think. All right, so I'm gonna draw that here to make it a little easier. F followed by C, L, followed by B, R, followed by I. Okay, at room temperature, fluorine is a green gas. Chlorine is a yellow gas. Bromine is a reddish liquid. And iodine is a deep purple or indigo solid. Okay, so what do we got? We got gas, gas, liquid, and solid, right? So you wouldn't normally think about sticking these in the same column or have arranged in any kind of um, um, relation to each other based on their physical properties but they're all in group 7A for a reason. And this is how the periodic table eventually got put together. Notice that we have two columns here, then this flat part in the middle, and then six columns on the end. And then they're in rows as well. So if you can read the periodic table, like uh, it's a translator, this is going to be a huge thing for everybody because this is the main tool that you're going to use to be able to do what we need you to do, which is look at, at what elements are where and be able to predict for some of them either what compound it will make or for the particular compound that you have, be able to understand and predict the kind of bonding that's going on, okay? So, um, real quickly, atoms have a stability due to neutral charge. I don't know why my computer is doing that. Right, same number of protons and electrons. But they can obtain extra stability and we're, we're going to give you the Storks version right now, but then we're going to talk in great detail about what I'm talking about now later on, okay? They can attain extra stability by having you completely empty.
completely full outer electron shell. Now, you guys don't know about electron shells yet. I want you to think of an atom as like a marble, that's the nucleus, inside a balloon that is inside a balloon that is inside a balloon that is inside a balloon. You with me on that? So it's sort of like a sphere inside a sphere inside a sphere inside a sphere. And the electrons live kind of on the surface of the balloon. All right. And what we'll find is that each of these rows is like a balloon. Think of the nucleus being up here. And this first row has two electrons. The second row is the second balloon farther away that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that's going to be the key, right? Completely empty means zero electrons. Completely full means eight electrons. I mean, except for the first row, helium is happy with two. But we'll talk about that as we move forward. But this is the key. Getting to eight is good. Getting to zero is good because that's the extra stability that they can get. All right. So here's the thing. You get to completely empty or completely full. And we talked about this from forming ions. Remember, cations lose electrons, anions gain electrons. And this is what they'll do. They'll try to gain electrons to get to eight or lose electrons to get to zero. And they'll do this the quickest way possible because you can gain electrons or lose electrons and it doesn't uh, there, there's no advantage to one versus the other, okay? So we'll just do that. And then we'll check to see on the periodic table how you can predict it, okay? Now watch. At the top of the periodic tables that you will get, you have a label, 1A, 2A, and down here are like the Bs. And then we've got 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A. Those group numbers tell you the number of electrons in the outer shell for the group A. You with me on that? So 1A means, well, let's move it down a little bit. Means one electron in the outer shell. Now, everybody wants zero or eight, right? To get to zero, if it has one, you can lose one electron. To get to eight, you have to gain seven. And I hope it's obvious that it's much easier to lose one electron, right? Than to gain eight or seven. So if you lose one electron, you make a plus one cation. And everybody in group 1A, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, 
what, rubidium, cesium, right? All of these guys. And the reason why they're in that column is they all like to make plus one cations. Sweet. See how easy it is to just look at the periodic table and predict? 2A. Two electrons in the outer shell. Once, zero, or eight. You'd have to lose two or gain six. Much easier to lose two. So you're going to make a plus two cation. And everybody in group 2A, everybody, let's see who's on there. There's beryllium, magnesium, calcium, barium, strontium. We don't really deal with the ones on the bottom. There you go. Okay. All of them want to make plus twos. Cool. Now, we're going to skip the middle part. We are going to dig into the middle part later in the semester. These are called transition metals, and they have variable charges. You can't predict just by looking at them what their charge is going to want to be. So we're going to skip those for now, OK? Because we're only dealing with group A numbers. And I hope it's obvious to you how this works. 3A, three electrons in the outer shell once, zero, or eight. You don't need to memorize this. I'd rather you recognize it. You could lose three, or you could gain five. It's starting to get closer, but it's still easier to lose three. And aluminum likes to make a plus three. Four A. Four electrons in the outer shell. Everybody wants zero or eight. You could lose four electrons, or you could gain four. There's no advantage. Now, if losing four means you make a plus four because you've lost four negative ones, adding four negative ones makes you a minus four anion. And carbon can actually make a plus four or a minus four. As it turns out, it's pretty hard to lose four or gain four. That's usually not even the kind of bonding that carbon or any of the elements in group 4A actually do, okay? Now, I want you to think about something real fast. At some point, look up sodium in water or lithium in water or alkali metals in water on YouTube. There's some really cool videos. This is incredibly violent. Okay? Because everybody in group 1A, sodium, lithium, potassium, they're all pretty desperate to get rid of that one electron so that they can get to their um, stable state. So they will lose electrons to anything. And if you throw them in water, it's crazy. I mean, I remember seeing this whenever I was a kid in uh, uh, like ninth grade. Um, sodium metal is, it looks like it's a silver shiny metal, but it's got the consistency of frozen butter. So you can cut it with a butter knife, but it has to be under oil because it will react with the moisture in the air. And my teacher took a little sliver of it and stuck it into a glass of water. And the thing sputtered and popped and fizzed and zipped along the, the surface of the water like it was a, um, like it was a, a a jet ski. It was <laughs> totally cool. Very reactive. 
magnesium or calcium is not nearly so reactive in water because two electrons are harder to grab than one. Aluminum, aluminum. Guys, you know about aluminum metal, right? Tin foil is actually not tin, it's aluminum, aluminum foil. If you took an aluminum foil that wrapped up your burger or was around your gum and you threw it into water, would it explode? Would it pop along? No, it just sits in there. Aluminum ladders stick in the pool. It's pretty hard to lose three electrons. You can do it, but aluminum metal is actually a pretty stable stuff. So you can see that the number of electrons you lose or gain can actually tell you a little bit about how reactive something is. Okay, let's keep going. 5A have five electrons in their outer shell. Everybody wants zero or eight. You'd have to lose all five to get to zero, or you'd have to gain three to get to eight. It's easier to gain three. So these guys like to make a minus three anion. And nitrogen likes to make a minus three. Nitrogen, phosphorus, everybody in group 5A. 6A. You can see the pattern here, right? Six electrons in the outer shell. Once zero or eight. You'd have to lose six electrons, which is pretty dang hard, or just gain two to get from six to eight. Easier to gain two. A minus two anion likes to form, like sulfur minus two. Now let's get to those seven A's that we had talked about before. Seven electrons in the outer shell of fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. It's the outer shell electrons that tell us how things are gonna to wanna to bond. And since they all have seven electrons in their outer shell, they all bond the same way, even if their physical properties are different. This was a major thing that chemists figured out. So seven electrons in the outer shell. Everybody wants zero or eight. You'd have to lose seven. And I got to tell you, losing seven is really hard, but gaining one is really easy. So you make a minus one anion and everybody, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine love to make a minus one anion. Eight A, eight electrons in the outer shell. We're not gonna worry about helium right now. Once zero or eight. Well, geez. It doesn't react because it's already got its eight. This is why these elements in the very end, helium. What is that? Can't even see. Neon. Argon, krypton, xenon. These are all called inert gases. Also called noble gases. We talked a little bit about the nobility. Let them eat cake. Noble gases are called noble because the nobility didn't interact with the riffraff. They didn't interact with anybody else. Noble gases don't react because they're already good. I got my eight, I'm good. I'm not giving away any and I don't need any. Just leave me alone. So having this in your hand, one, two, skip the middle, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you can see where the eight electrons is there. So it's easy to tell the importance of the octet. And you can predict just by having this in your hand, what ions will form. 
And if you can predict what ions form, then you know the kind of bond that you're going to form for those if you're making an ionic bond. So let's talk about the two different kinds of bonds that we're going to deal with mostly in this class. In ionic bonding, electrons are transferred to form cation and anion. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, how to put together an ionic compound. This is really, really important. versus covalent bonding, where electrons are shared. And no charges form. And we will dig into this more as we go. But what I do want to do is list for you how you go about making ionic compounds correctly, OK? Number one. Every ionic compound only has one type of cation and one type of anion. With me, you're never going to have like calcium, chlorine, fluorine. It's never going to be. All right, so you can identify the cation and then identify the anion. Cation first, anion last. Total charge of all ions must equal zero. That's how you figure out how an ionic compound gets put together. The total of all the cations and the total of all the anions all together has to equal zero. That's how you make and figure out the formula of the ionic compound. The compound must have the smallest counting number ratio of the ions. An ion compound will never be Na3Cl3. It's always just going to be NaCl. Okay. Um, you never show the charges. in in a compound but you always show charges Okay, writing the charges in on a compound is uh, redundant. Good chemist can look at a compound, know that it's um, an ionic compound and can figure out what the charges are. It's 
So that's wrong. You'd have to only write NaCl. Okay. But Na is definitely not the same as Na plus. Because when we're dealing with an individual ion, I guarantee you that if you sprinkle Na plus on your fries, they will have a delicious saltiness. If you sprinkle Na on your fries and you take a bite, your face is going to explode. And as cool as that would be, we can't have that because Na is different than Na plus because the Na has lost its electron and it's now in a stable state. Na is a, is a neutral atom that's looking to get rid of its electron, okay? So, take a look at that periodic table. You see over here, and then over here, and then this dark part here, this separates out the metals from the non-metals. Okay? These things right along here are called the semi-metals because they sort of act a little bit like metals and a little bit like non-metals. And semiconductors are all along this line because they act a little bit like metals and a little bit like not. And remember, a computer is all about controlling the flow of the electrons. Okay. Now, to predict bonding in compounds, we're going to do this first. And then we're going to show you how to do. Uh, um, ionic compounds. To predict bonding in compounds, there are only three possibilities. Metal plus metal they don't make a compound. They don't bond. All they do is make a mixture, okay, like brass, which is just copper plus zinc. We already talked about that. So we're never really going to have to worry about one. Two and three are the ones we need to think about. Metal plus non-metal. is where you have ionic bonding. So if you have an element over here, it's on the metal side, combining with an element over here on the non-metal side, that's going to be ionic bonding. Na is way over here. Cl is way over here. NaCl is a metal plus a non-metal. With me? Then the other possibility is non-metal plus non-metal. And that's covalent bonding, sometimes called molecular, same thing. Like CO2. O is here. C is here. So a non-metal plus a non-metal makes covalent. Metal plus non-metal makes ionic. Okay, so another hunk of information that the periodic table can really help you with. If you see a compound and I ask you what kind of bonding is in there, figure out where crap is. Should be easy to tell from there, okay? Okay, so now let's try to figure out how to determine what ionic compound 
formula will form. And then if I have an ionic compound, how to split them up into their individual ions. It's sort of going in both directions. Okay, remember all those rules for ionic compounds? That's sort of the basic question. What ionic compound forms from a couple of elements? So let's try, um, let's try L, I, and F. Well, I hope it's obvious what you do. You have to figure out if you can, what the ion will be. Remember, this is a metal plus a non-metal. Right? So Li is in group 1A. So it makes, right? It has one electron in its outer shell. It wants zero or eight. It's going to lose one to make an Li plus one. Fluorine is in group 7A. It has seven electrons in its outer shell. It wants to lose, it wants to gain one to get to eight. And so it's going to make a minus one. Well, how would you combine Li plus one plus F minus one so that you get a zero overall charge? I think that's obvious, right? It's a one-to-one -one ratio. So you can just say one Li plus one F makes LiF zero charge. And you don't put the charges up there. It's only for individual ions. And that's the compound. All right, that's easy peasy lemon squeezy, obviously. Let's try a different one. Well, let's not do Li. Let's do um, C, A, and C, L. Okay. C, A, and C, L. All right. So how do we think about this? Calcium is in group 2A. So it likes to make a plus 2. It's a metal. Chlorine is also in group 7A. So it also is going to make a minus 1. Do you see where... If you know that fluorine makes a minus one, then everything in group 7A likes to make a minus one. So you don't really have to think about it all that much, right? Okay, well, if we went one calcium plus two plus one Cl minus one, what would we make? We'd make a CaCl, but a plus two and a minus one would be a plus one, and that can't be right. And I hope it's obvious that we need two minus ones to even out the one plus two, right? Notice that the key here, when you look at this, and by the way, we don't write it like this, and we don't write it like that, and we don't even write it like this. We have to write it like that. The subscripts tell you how many of each atom before it there are in the compound. Okay? No charges up on top. That tells you this. When you see this, you have to, in your head, recognize there are two ions. And when you see this, you have to recognize there are three ions here. People who write this don't know what they're talking about. 
because chlorine only wants to make a minus one, okay? So this is key. Looking at this, recognizing there are three ions. Everybody with me on that? Cool. Let's keep going. We can do a couple more. How about Mg and O? Well, Mg is in group 2A. So it makes a plus two. Oxygen is in group 6A. So it makes a minus two. Now, some of you, I know, I'm aware, do the cross multiply thing, right? I get that. But if you write the answer as Mg2O2, it's wrong. Okay, it doesn't work all the time because you have to remember it's the smallest ratio. Think about it. If Mg wants to lose two electrons and oxygen comes along with six and wants two, what's going to happen? One Mg is going to give both electrons to the oxygen so that the Mg now has zero and the oxygen has five, six, seven, eight, and it's happy. So the ratio is one Mg to one O. Got it? Now remember, it's easy to identify that Mg is a metal because it's on the left-hand side and the oxygen is a non-metal because it's on the right-hand side. Uh, let's do one more just for fun. Calcium is a plus two because it's in group 2A. Phosphorus is in group 5A. Five wants to add three electrons. And this is where I will admit to you that the cross multiply method works pretty nicely. But the way you write that is You should check yourself. Three times plus two plus two times minus three, right? Minus three on the charge, two of them. Plus two on the charge, three of them adds up to zero. Plus six, negative six. Which means this ionic compound. has a total of five ions. Three plus twos. And two minus threes. It's huge. Okay, if that's all there was to ionic compounds, that would be pretty straightforward and easy and good. And it is, but there's also something called a polyatomic ion, a many atom ion. Okay. It's just how it goes. This is nature. And we can actually later in the semester show you how these polyatomic ions are assembled but I'm gonna tell you what they are and you sort of need to know them, okay? NH4 likes to be a plus one. OH minus, NO3 minus, NO2 minus, ClO4 minus, ClO3 minus, C2, H3, O2 minus one. All of these guys like to be minus ones. All of these guys like to be minus twos. There's many, many more ions. These are the ones that we have you 
um, looking at and using the most. Uh, actually, this is one as well. These guys act exactly the same. as a thing with a minus three charge. They're just all together, okay? So another way to like sort of think about it, look at it, goes like this. Uh, calcium and PO4 minus three. Okay, you know calcium is a plus two and the PO4 is a minus three. You can do that. cross-multiply thing again. So you're going to have three calciums and two phosphates. If you remember, it was Ca3P2. Now it's Ca3PO4, two. Now I'm going to do the next page and show you what these look like because what we really want to do is look at the bonding associated with them. So if I look at this, I want you to see this. The little three means three of the calciums. And we know the calcium always makes a plus two charge. What's going on with this PO4? Well, PO4 means literally this. There are four oxygens with every P, and these things together happen to make a minus three. Now, kind of bonding exists here? Well, plus two, minus three means there's ionic bonding between the cation and anion. But Right, because this is a metal and this is a anion. Okay. But what's going on here? Phosphorus is a non metal. Oxygen is a non metal. Non metal plus non metal makes covalent bonding. Right? That's how bonding works for polyatomic ions. It's covalent bonding within the polyatomic ion. It just bonds in such a way that there's a charge associated with it. So, so covalent within polyatomic. So every time you have a compound that contains a polyatomic ion, the bonding is both. Okay? So I think the last quick thing that we can do here is take a compound and tear it apart to figure out what the ions have to be. And then I'll do a quick review of uh, what you need to study for for the exam. And then I will get this video out to everybody so that they can look it over. Okay. Okay. There are two different kinds 
of compounds that can form between iron and sulfur. The reason why is that Fe is a transition metal. Right, it's it's right here, right smack dab in the middle of sort of Death Valley here. Okay. So therefore there are variable charges that are possible. Okay. Variable charges. And you can't tell by looking, but you can tell from the anion, right? So Fe is equal to, I don't know, but sulfur, a group 6A is equal to S minus two. So if the anion, identifying the anion as S minus two, right? Anion is second. What does the Fe have to be in order for it to add up to zero? I think it's obvious, right? Plus two, because one Fe with I don't know what charge plus one sulfur with a minus two charge has to equal zero. So therefore, one times x plus negative two is equal to zero, x is equal to plus two, right? Okay, so what about Fe is equal to, I don't know, sulfur is always equal to a minus two, right? But when we have two Fe's, plus three sulfurs, and the total has to be zero. Three times minus two, two times I don't know, right? Two X plus negative six is equal to zero. Two X is equal to plus six. X is equal to plus three. So the cation here is plus three and the anion here is minus two. So even if you can't figure out from the periodic table, what the charges are on the cation and anion from the ionic compound, you can figure it out because I'm gonna give you at least one of them, right? I'll give you either the cation or the anion that's a group A or a polyatomic ion. So you should be able to tell from there and then work backwards. Okay. That's pretty much the end of what we're going to ask of you on this exam. You have some good hard work to do in order to get up to speed on this. But I will certainly be available to you all day today. I will answer your emails on Saturday. I will answer your emails on Sunday. And that will help you to get some questions answered. So I have the exam right here. These are the topics you'd better be ready to be able to do. Let's take a quick look. Let's see, what do we got? Physical change versus chemical change. You should be able to predict this. Intensive versus extensive properties. Let's 
let's see what else um sig figs standard scientific notation put together and take apart ionic compounds. Take apart means what ions are present. Put together means ionic formula. Okay, you need to be able to predict the bonding. It's gonna be ionic, covalent, or both. Um, conversion factors. calculations. Just the stuff that we've been asking you to do. And you should know the metric to metrics. Okay. What else? Your job is to know naming. If I give you an ionic compound, and part of this is predicting the bonding because if you know it's ionic, then you knew the, know the ionic rules. And if you know it's covalent, then you use the molecular rules, right? That video and all that stuff is already on in place. You should know the experiments. Right? Who did what? What did they learn? Are the experiment questions going to be like the ones on homework too? I can remember what homework two was. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Be able to, for any isotope, know what an isotope is and be able to count up the protons, neutrons, and electrons, okay? Be able to do those isotopic abundance calculations. Do the percent calculations, right? Part over whole times 100% is equal to the percentage of the part. Let's see, that's that. Uh, know in general what elements are compared to compounds and where the, what their place on the periodic table tells you in general. Um, if there's anything else. Oh. One last one. You have to do temperature conversion. Okay. Guys, that's it. That's what's coming.
that's what you have to be ready for. Thank you so much for dragging your sorry butts onto Zoom. I'm sorry that this happened. I hope that this is useful to everybody. Um, please hit me up with questions. Um, and then you can also have some questions for me uh, when we get together on Monday. Um, I think I'm going to not have a quiz this weekend, let you work on the homework, let you study away. And um, if you have any questions, please hit me up. I'll be glad to help. Sorry to keep you over as your next um, test uh, 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 lecture begins. Um, if you already left, that's fine. Like I said, I'm going to be sending out the videos to everybody, or hopefully if I can figure out how to do it uh, so that everybody can uh, get in there and um, know what's coming, study up. A lot of this is review for a lot of you, I'm hoping. Hang in there, take care, talk to you soon. Jesse, Abdullah, and Jack, I can answer questions if you're still here and have any. And if not, see you later. <laughs>